how your freedom is all that I know. The old man knew. Jesus went out and made you. You called my name. And I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness. Into your glory. Allergies kicking in at full swing there at the end of that bridge. <clears throat> um, this next song we're going to sing is a new song. Um, it's called Anchor. I sent it out. Um, oh, no, I didn't send it out. I just realized that I forgot. I did? I posted it on Facebook? Oh, never mind. Okay, I did. I thought there for a second I forgot. Anyways, um, so some of you may have heard it and listened to it. Um, it's a great song, but I want to do this song this morning because um, Robert is going to be preaching about... Uh, picking the, the passage from, what is it, John 5? John 5. Um, the passage where Jesus tells the man to pick up his mat and to walk. And um, what I like about, because I've heard that story a hundred times, I've heard it preached a hundred times, but it's, what he's really going to talk about that really hit me different is um, when he tells him to pick up his mat and walk, he's talking about, he's telling him to, to take away, to, to move on. No, don't leave your mat there. Don't leave room for provision is the word that he used. And don't don't leave that there. Um, so the idea is about getting up and being a new creation. And um, I like this song, Anchor, because it talks about Christ being our anchor. And we can't, we don't have the strength on our own to get up and to be a new creation. We have to have Christ um, and, and his strength and through the Holy Spirit to be able to be that new creation. And so this song is just singing, is praising God for, for being our anchor and steadying us in, in, in the crazy storms, um, in the angry oceans, um, as the chorus says. So sing this together. Drifting beneath the horizon My body is weak but I'm trying to make it to shore But I'm falling short I need you That's a way but been sinking So unto your promise I'm clinging To say that I'm strong To you I belong And keep holding on You are my
Come steady me, steady me now. Sing that chorus one more time, a cappella. You are my anchor. So steady me, steady me now. You are my anchor. You're keeping my feet on the ground. In angry oceans, you've never broken through every wave of the storm. You are my anchor. So steady me, steady me now. Come steady me, steady me now. Amen. Robert? Thank you. Mm. You are my anchor, amen? I'm going to move all of his stuff there because I always mess with his papers and then he comes up to sing the next song and it's the wrong one. All right. So two weeks ago, I did a magic trick. No magic trick today. Brett's like, thank you. Uh, grab your Bibles. Go to John chapter 5. We are continuing through this opportunity. I would say story. And sometimes, I'm going to clarify, story doesn't mean it's not true. It's just impactful and written to a purpose. Right? When we read through the, the, the book of John, it is written so that you might believe. Now, we're going to talk about belief. We're going to talk about that. Let me clarify real quickly. Belief is not knowledge. We're going to look into this as well. It's just not knowing everything. It's just not shoving more in without doing anything with what you know. So often, sometimes, at least for me, I get caught up to, i got to know more. I do counseling and time with people. They, they ask me, they say, well, I want to know, what, do, what am I supposed to do? And so often, we don't get past the first question I kind of go is, has God already told you something to do that you haven't done yet? You, you ever feel like that? God's like, God's put on my heart to do that, but I want something, I want it, I want it prettier. I mean, could, I, could you bedazzle that, that thing you want for me, Lord? So often, we forget the first thing and seek to find something more appealing, maybe. So today, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about the, the simplicity of obedience, the simplicity of, of this phrase that, that Jesus is going to give to a paralyzed man, a man who could do nothing of his own will. And Jesus says, get up. Now, I want to ask you a question. We live in a, uh, I don't know what we call it, a, 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 you know, politically correct, right? We live, we live where we got to be proper, you know, and I try to be, I'm, you know, I, I barely speak English well, so me making sure my words are right are hard. But, but does, it, does that sound a little tough at first? Jesus goes up to a paralyzed man and says, do you want to get better? Does that feel, I mean, let's be honest. If we're sitting somewhere and we see someone walk up to a person in a wheelchair and say, do you want to get better? It, 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 does that hit you like it hits me? What in the world are you saying? My uh, defense protective nature wants to come up and says, you want to say that to me? Like, what are you doing? But do, do we live in a world that that seems ridiculous? That's just how they are, right? It's, it's, it's not a disability. It's a, there's a cool phrase. I like phrases. It's a, 
It's, it's a different ability. It's not a disability. It's a different ability. And, and amen. I mean, I come from, I'm going to confess a disability. I've got binocular vision, reading things without my glasses, and even with my glasses doesn't work really well. And by binocular vision, I see like two things at once, and my brain makes one. So in fact, we're going to read this chapter in a second. Brett's going to read it all for me because I've lost my glasses. And so uh, so it's not a disability. It's a different ability. And so I'm going to use his different ability in a second. And and we live in this world that we say we can't ask people to change. We Man, that's just how I am. That's just who I am. I'm an addict. I'm a sinner. I'm a judger. I'm a gossiper. I'm going to tell you what God says to you today. Do you want to be healed? We're going to talk about that today. So, grab a Bible. If you don't have one, we have some in back. I'll let you borrow mine because my eyes aren't working very well today. So, it's just blurry for me. But uh, grab a Bible. We're going to go to John chapter 5. And this is what we're going to do. I want you to first hear his word. Faith does come from hearing and hearing of the word of God. But faith means put feet to, not feet to faith, put feet to the knowledge. So first we're going to do, we're going to hand you the knowledge. We're going to hand you this word. John chapter 5. Brett's going to come read it. And then we're going to unwrap it. We're going to, we're going to do uh, a, a break through this. So I'm going to let you read this. I'm going to Say a prayer, and then Brett's going to read. So you'll turn that mic on there. All right, here we go. Let's pray, and then listen to God's word. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you. We praise you. We praise you, Lord. We praise you. God, we want to move. Let's be honest. There may be some in this room that don't want to. There might be some listening online right now that. that are comfortable in their uncomfortable. They're comfortable with the struggle and say, that's just who I am. But God, Lord, I pray you bless this moment as, as we listen to your word being read and we hear the unfolding of your grace and the testimony of your truth. God, speak to us. Allow us to put some feet to this knowledge so that faith may grow. Bless us in these words. I pray these be your words, Lord, not ours, not, not Brett's or mine, but, but you just speak to our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. John chapter 5. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep get a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roof colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up and while I'm going, another steps down before me. And Jesus said to him, Get up, take your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed, and he took his bed and he walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. Verse 10. So the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It is a Sabbath, and it is not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, the man who healed me, that man said to me, take up your bed and walk. They asked him, who is this man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, as there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to them, see, you're well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, My father is working until now, and I am working. 
This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making him equal with God. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing on his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will be shown to him. So you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has all judgment to the Son, or has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of Son and God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming, when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I can do nothing on my own as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not deemed true. There is another who bears witness to me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent John, and now he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony I receive from this man, but I say the things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and a shining lamp, and you are willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe in the one who he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is that they bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come into my Father's name. You do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, in whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Thank you, Brett. So I want to unfold this and fill in maybe some information for us to understand. This setting is most likely the Passover. We don't know. There's three major festivals, and one of them that it seems to be here, it's the Passover. Now, if you keep reading ahead, you'll see in chapter 6, it's going to talk about the Passover as well. But most scholars believe this is most likely the festival that they're at. When the Passover happens in Jerusalem, of about 100,000, from best I understand, in the city at that time, it can go up to about a million people in the city of Jerusalem. And these guys are excited. Like, this is their, it's the, it's their Thanksgiving meal, right? This is big. Y'all do think, who does Thanksgiving like Thanksgiving? Anybody? Okay, what? what's a favorite Thanksgiving item? What's your favorite Thanksgiving food? What is it? Pecan pie. Ooh, okay, I like me some pecan pie. All right. I hear this stuff called homemade, but man, pecan's pecan pie. I'll take it to a store or homemade. What else? What favorite food? 
Anyone? What's your favorite food, young lady? Cake at Thanksgiving. I can see that. That's, you know, we're going sweets today. What else? Favorite food? The stuffing. All right. Stuffing's pretty good. Anyone else? I mean, one more favorite food. What is it? You have a favorite food at Thanksgiving? Lobster at Thanksgiving? Only he's like lost. Dude, we are in Salina, Solomon, Kansas. That ain't fresh. I'm just telling you that. You know what I mean? That's called a uh, crawdad, right? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. All right. Cr- baby lobster. Ooh, crawdads. You ever see them? Man, they were that small and it's looking at me. I'm having issues. You know? You know, you're wrestling that thing down. Okay. Mine is, is beets. All right. Let me clarify. My mom makes like sugared. Uh, okay, it's like 90% sugar, but it, the, the word starts with beet, so it's a vegetable, right? So it's totally keto. Yeah, but, but that's it. I mean, you know that feeling you gather for Thanksgiving, and you're all excited, and you bring like enough food for like 80 people, but there's three of you? That might have just been me. Okay, um, and then, you, you know, you eat till you pass out, and then you wake up and you eat again, and you realize the second eating, it doesn't need to be heated. You know what I'm talking about? The first eating, you know, you're like, yeah, it's properly cooked and temperatured. Second eating, nah, who cares? Slice that up, put everything on a sandwich. You know what I mean? Every, you like, the entire turkey meal can fit on a sandwich. Maybe pecan pie. We'll see. I'll have to try that this Thanksgiving. But that's how exciting it is. You've got to see the scene. I'm not Jewish. You're not Jewish. So to us, it's kind of, so let's Americanize this and say, like, this is, like, the, the 10th family reunion Thanksgiving meal. It's big. Everyone comes. Crazy Aunt Harriet, you know her? Sits in the back, smells like cat. You know her, right? Like, she's all excited. You know, she hugs you. You're trying to get away. You know, that's the scene. A million of this family Jews are gathered. And there's a pool. It's called the Pool of Bethsaida. In Aramaic, it means the Pool of Mercy. And it's by the Sheep Gate. It's the Passover. Everyone, good Jewish person, has taken their sheep through the Sheep Gate. And you know what happens? you got to know the scene of what's unfolding. It's great reading, and I love it. But, but to experience what goes on here, That pool is also the pool where they wash the sheep. So everyone goes by the pool. So a whole bunch of paralyzed people are going, man, you're feeling really good today. I'll take a slice of your pecan pie on the way in. Do you get it now? So normally about 1,000 people might gather around. They say up to 10,000 people who are paralyzed and lame are sitting there at the pool of Bethsaida waiting can you give me a little bit of mercy? That's the story. So we're at the Pool of Bethsaida. Now, I love the Pool of Bethsaida because it's one of, the, one of the stories that, that people who are against the Bible said, there's no pool. See, the Bible's wrong, and there was no pool. They went to Jerusalem. I mean, it's real easy. It says there's a pool by the, east, the Sheep Gate. That's the Eastern Gate, and it's right there. Couldn't find it. So see, it, it's not true. Well, some archaeological diggings were going on. And guess what they found? A pool. Guess what they found as well? Because, I, 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 right? Y'all been to a pool before? Water, right? When you read this, you go, wait a second. It says five colonnades. Last time I saw a pool, it's got four sides. So the Bible is true. Here's what's awesome. They start digging up, and they found out. They're colonnade. That's a port, right? There's one, two, three, four. As they kept digging, they found a colonnade right down the middle. The Scripture's true. They found it. That's still not the point. But this story is so powerful. I understand they're sitting at the pool and they're gathering around and, and there's this story. 
Now, for me, I'm reading out of NIV, and the NIV, on the bottom of my Bible, there's some italic writing at an angle. I need to explain what this is. So when you're reading your Bible, it's good to know what you're reading. So there are some scriptures, older scriptures, that don't have this story. I'm going to use the word story for the meaning here in it. Now, this could be one of two things, and I'm okay with either because it doesn't argue with itself. Let me read this extra verse. For me, it's verse 4. I want you to hear it and explain it. Because if someone asks you, I want to give you some ability to answer that question. Verse 4, it says, From time to time an angel of the Lord would come down and stir the water. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of what the disease said. What? Some of you might not even have that in your Bible. Or some of you have it in there on italic or under parentheses. Well, this was written in Greek. They didn't have parentheses. We made those rules. And so what this was, based on the writing, it, it's okay if it's true because it fits, right? If, if, it's new, if it's new, it's not true. If it's true, it's not new. So this isn't a new thing being here. Because if you keep reading, the guy even says in response to Jesus, there was no one to get me into the water when it got stirred. I don't know what it was. And let it be an angel. I don't, I don't know an angel being like that. Well, scripture says the angels hold the law and shared it. So, so maybe, and I'll show you a cool parallel in a second, but if that's what it was, maybe it was an angel just saying, hey, okay, we're going to go offer a bit of healing. I don't know. It doesn't fit. But if it is, that's fine. It works. But we have to understand, at this time, we're underneath the Old Covenant. So let's, let's spend a moment here on this side. And symbolization to the Old Covenant. If you just work hard enough, you'll get healed. See, the old, the old law was the law. Right? We read right about Moses, and, and he's got the law on one side, and the tabernacle or the, 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 the sacrificial system on the other. And so, so what this is, is a great symbol of the story of Christ. That if you work hard enough, what's the phrase? Work hard, try, fail, repeat. Right? And you just work hard enough. And that's where he's at. Every time the, the, the stirring happens. Now, it could have been an angel or it could have been. They're finding out that there was a natural spring there. And, and I, to be honest here, are our brains pretty powerful? Does anyone know what a placebo is? You know, they found and done tests with placebos. That if you give someone a placebo, and, and it might it'd literally be a sugar pill, your brain is so powerful, you think it's something that might heal you. There's some healing going on. You know what they also did? This is an interesting test. They told people, this is a placebo. They took the pill, and guess what happened? Some people got better. That's how powerful God's designed this thing. So maybe it could be that it wasn't an angel, but it was the story. That every time the bubbles happen, first one in. Whichever one it is, the story of Christ is true. And the story of how, how the, the sacrificial system connects with the law. And Jesus finds the man. This guy who's been trying hard, fail, repeat. We prayed this morning. And our prayer, or my hope to pray and encourage us to do was to ask God, to ask you, to ask God. I think I said that right. This idea that God's calling you. God found you. You're not here by accident. You're not listening to this online by accident. God found you. As the story unfolds, verse 1, sometime later, Jesus went to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now they're in Jerusalem. was near the sheep gate of the pool, which is an Aramaic called Bethsaida, in which surrounded five covered colonnades. There, a great number of disabled people 
used to lie, the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. God goes to the place of the hurting. He sees them. Verse 5. One who had been there, an invalid for 39 years, when Jesus saw him lying there, he had learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, and he asked him, and if this isn't underlined in your Bible, I wish it was, do you want to be healed? See, there's this difference between knowledge and faith. Now, Scripture makes clear faith comes in hearing and hearing of the Word of God. That's the knowledge. There is truth. And we'll know this because of what Brett read later on. Jesus even clarifies the testimony. You know the Word. You search the Word, but you don't find me. So Jesus asks this question. And I want to ask you. Do you want to be healed? That's it. That's the lesson right here. I, I, you need to know, do you want to be healed? If you can't answer this question, there's no reason to know step two. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to live that same life Try hard, fail, repeat. Underneath the law. Underneath it says, I will never be that. Now I want you to see something Jesus didn't say. So go do all these things. Correct all the sins in your life. Say five Hail Marys. Put money into the plate. And then you're healed. Now, before I keep talking, some of you, like me, goes, wait a minute. I've read more of the Bible. And James says, you have faith. I'll show you my faith through my works. Here's the problem. The works are not what save, but the works are the product of a saved life. You've got to see it. Hold on. I'm going to show you. I love the chair. It's like my favorite. I'm just going to carry a chair around with me. Here we go. Can you see me on there from here? Okay. So we've talked about the chair. Now, initially, I give you the chair as an analogy what belief looks like. I trust the chair. But imagine this. Imagine the faith is I'm stuck in the chair. And God comes up to me and says, do you want to be out of the chair? I know this chair. This chair makes sense. Does this chair make sense to you? I know I don't need to be depressed, but if I assume everyone hates me, then I don't get hurt. I know I should be loving to my spouse, but if I do, they're going to hurt me again. Not me. That's more from, I'm, I'm, I'm married the best woman in the world, so. I know if I talk about God at work, I'm going to get mocked again. I know God says I don't need to do those things that I shouldn't do. But how am I supposed to feel good? How am I supposed to find comfort? I know the chair. And Jesus walks up to the lame man, and he sees him, and I, and I don't want to say comfortable. There's a time in my life where 
uh, my family and I went through a trial, and I was lame. I was almost paralyzed. Ruptured a disc in my back, L3, L4. And I spent 20 hours in the bed. Uh, couldn't walk, couldn't feel my legs. Uh, went into the ER in a wheelchair. Uh, and I can walk today. And I, I don't want to say it was comfortable, but I was comfortable with the uncomfortable. That's what I knew. My wife's an occupational therapist, and, and she taught me new ways, but everything I had to do to start moving hurt. And you go to therapy, and it was hard. But she said these things, Robert, if you don't get up and move, you will never get out of this bed. But it hurt. Finally had to go get surgery, and it hurt. Had to do life differently, and it hurt. It was work. So Jesus says to this paralyzed man, do you want to be healed? Now, if you don't know the answer to this question, go back and listen to everything Brett has been talking to us in Romans. Do you know that Jesus had already healed him? The debts paid. The old man was nailed to the cross. The paralyzed man was nailed to the cross. Yet he didn't put feet to his knowledge. He was living in his old identity. And here's another thing I want you to see. Remember Thanksgiving? This was the cream of the crop of getting help time. This was the guy that everyone knew had been there for a long time. This is the one he had built relationships. Hey, I saw it to the last thing. Yeah, could you help me again today? So when he goes up to this man and says, do you want to be better? He's like, man, I'm doing pretty good right now. I mean, maybe it would have been more impactful if it would have been like not during a festival time. You know, about, about halfway through and all the extra blessings and people aren't as guilty when they're watching him walk by. And he's like, you know, when, when life's get a little bit tougher, you know, they're like, ooh, got a tripper. When life gets a little bit tougher, you know, then maybe. But no, Jesus goes to the paralyzed man in kind of the midst of blessing. He hasn't gotten to work. Food's getting delivered. He's getting fresh lamb. He says, do you want to be healed? So don't take offense to that phrase. I work with men who I ask that question to almost every day. Who struggle in addiction. Who know one way of life. Sometimes people come to me and say, you tell the guys where you work you can't have a cell phone in their room. Yeah. Because I deal with guys who probably look at stuff they shouldn't on their cell phone. Say, you tell a guy that they've got to go do job applications or they're kicked out. So, yeah. Give them grace, but... Yeah, because if you don't work, you're not going to change. You make them do chores? I don't make them. I give them the choice. I said, do you want to get better? So this isn't a new concept, but maybe for our society, it, it's a little more real today. Because it's comfortable to come to church, Depending who's preaching, it's different lengths. I don't know, man. I was going to go two chapters today. I was going to take you down. I was gonna, I'm going to do in two hours. But you, they all got stuff to throw. I'm not. It, it's comfortable to just come. Feel good for a minute. I mean, they're not asking me to do anything. I'll just sit. And go home. 
And I'd say punch our pew card, but we got chairs, so punch our, car, our chair card and move on. But the reality is God's asked you a question, do you want to be healed? And that question lies at your feet. Do you want to be healed? And look what's next. Verse 7, he says, Sir, the invalid replied, I've got no one to help me into the pool. When the water is stirred while I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. I've tried it. I've done it the way I was told to do it. I'm trying to live by the law, and it doesn't seem to be enough. I keep trying, and I fail and repeat. And, and Jesus didn't say, oh, well, okay, then. Nice try. I'll talk to the next guy. You want to be healed? No, he, he wasn't afraid to speak into that man's life. Verse 8. And again, man, if this isn't underlined, this should be your verse. Then Jesus said to him, get up. Pick up your mat and walk. The choice was there. Get up. 38 years. Do you think that's all he knew? What's the world say? Let's, let's medically break this down for just a quick second. The world says at 38 years, his body has gone into, what's that thing called? Atrophy. The world says that's impossible. The world says, I'm an alcoholic. What do you mean stop drinking today? The world says, I'm addicted. What do you mean quit today? The world says, my body has caught into atrophy. I'm not moving. That's what the world says. Jesus doesn't even comment on it. Get up. Thirty-eight years. Now I, I'm assuming, based upon some other part of the scripture, you keep reading. I'm assuming he wasn't born paralyzed, but that's an assumption. So I think he's a little older than 38. But if he was only 38 years and was born paralyzed, here's a bigger statement: He never learned how to walk. So what would we want to say? Start rolling over, right? I mean, I remember the day my son was, how old was he? He was um, a couple months old, and he, Audra comes in, and they're like, hey, Jeremiah rolled over. I'm like, yeah, that's my boy. The book says, like, not till 12 months. That's my boy. But he didn't roll over. The doctor literally made fun of us because I went in all excited because first time papa, right? So everything he did, like, whoa, he sneezed. Yay. So I go to the doctor. I'm like, yeah, huh? Your book says he doesn't roll over to this date. And my boy rolled over. The doctor says, yeah, he probably he just like dropped him. I'm going to go, well, but I mean, that's it, right? So we would have started with that. Right? If we were Jesus, we would have said to the guy, all right, I want you just to roll over. You know? <laughs> you know? That's, that's well, that would have been me. I would have been like, all right, all you got to do is I just want you to bring your Bible. Just bring your Bible to church. You don't got to read it. No, just open your Bible, right? That would have been me. That would have been me. You don't really got to do any of this. I just, you know, I want you to punch the card. That would have been me. But Jesus says, get up, and it gets worse. That's a slippery corner. It's okay, just get up. There we go. It is slippery. Someone get them a towel. It's all right. We're going to get you off. Don't worry. It's all right. You know, when those things happen, I was speaking at Unite Salina, and the sound system went crazy when I started talking about Jesus. And they all freaked out and got nervous. You know what I said? Oh, that's okay. That's Satan. He gets one. That's it. Because God takes the rest. So the world says, don't ask him to change. The world says. And Jesus says, no, not only do I want you to get up. And this man, when I saw this, it hit me. Because there's moments in my life, I'm like, okay, I can change for a day. Right? I mean, I fast in between breakfast and lunch. 
like nobody's business. I am super keto after I eat the candy bar. You know? I, I exercise in between every bag of potato chips. I mean, I totally nail it, right? He says this simple phrase that hits me, church. I'll tell you what, it frustrates me. It hurts. He says, take up the mat. Now, I was going to be really mean and have our little kiddos there because I've tricked them. They've been sitting on a mat. And I was going to have them roll it up. And they say, sit back down, right? You see, this is the terminology that I want you to see. That God is, not only is he going to ask you to do something, the only way you're going to do it is with God. He's then going to say, and then I don't want you to leave any provision to the old self. Right? Remember we talk about that old man nailed? And I love this because Brett talks so much about this, and I need to hear it, Brett. I need to hear that I'm not the old man anymore. But so often, I'm the, old, I'm the dude climbing onto the thing, trying to see how strong those nails are. God, you really, I really can't pull it off. And he says, leave no provision. Leave no provision for sin. You mean I'm going to share honestly? Here we go. Are you ready? I suffer with pride. I do. I mean, I do. Pride. It, and I mean, I, don't, I mean, I'm good at pride. I'm, I'm proud about how good I am about pride, right? You know, I mean, I'm the best narcissist I know. I made a mistake once, and I realized it wasn't a mistake, but that was a mistake, and I realized it was a mistake. And those are all fun jokes, but I suffer with pride. I do. I get angry about it. I attack the people who, who don't think the way I think. The world says, Robert, you're preaching to a church. Shut up and don't share your sin. Someone here has something they struggle with? Something that you've not put on the cross yet? Something that, that you just want to just say, man, I need to stop that. I, I need to stop being angry. I need to stop being judging. I need to stop lusting. I need to stop having a pride issue that I shouldn't have. And is, is there something that you just haven't let go of? Have you left the mat laying somewhere in your life? But Jesus speaks bluntly and boldly, and he says, take it up and don't make provision anymore. Not so you'll be healed. You have to hear this. He was healed. You're healed. You're redeemed. It's all redeemed. Jesus hung it all on the cross. There's no negotiation there. So we don't stop there. Get up. You're redeemed. Right where you're at. And the beauty of is, is this walking process. There's still work to go. And I, I mean, I wanted to go into six, but I'm not. But you go into six and we'll be there in two weeks. Because he's going to speak into his disciples, the ones that have decided to get up. And they've got a little bit of mat issues. Because he's going to say, hey, let's heal them. Right? Let's, let's go ahead. Let's go feed the 5,000. He says it to Philip. And you know what? That's in his hometown. He's talking about his mat. And Philip's like, man, it costs so much. That's his mat, isn't it? Like, I know how much it, I know where you get the fish. I would have given you a discount. I got a guy. Right? Scripture says, but Jesus knew. He was giving him a chance to see, are you going to trust the mat 
We're going to walk in the faith. So go read that this week. There comes a choice. In a few minutes, we're going to do communion. And what I love about communion, it's a remembrance of your new reality. you have your Bibles, turn to John 6. Again, we're not going to John 6, but I'm doing for communion. So I'm sneaking a little into 6 just because I want to read this to you. John 6, verse 53 and following says this. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. In a few minutes, we can give you an opportunity to come and take communion. So we got this phrase that we've been saying, and I was driving around the city today, and it, the phrase we've been using is come as you are. Right? There's another uh, body of believers in the town, and guess what's on their billboard now? Come as you are. So the message is true everywhere. Jesus says, Come. You're healed. And that's what we're remembering today. So it's a little different. So we're going to have an opportunity to say a prayer. We're going to take communion. And I'm going to close this out with this, with one more thing. And then we're going to one more song. But I'll, I'll, as we pray, I want you to come up. Uh, because of COVID, we would have let Patras past it, but we're going to ask you to get up. All right, so there you go. First practice. Man, I should be a teacher. I'm in a school. I should be a teacher, right? What's that called? Like you give a practical. Oh, we got a print. I, I don't know. I wish I knew teaching. He's like, man, you are not going to be a teacher. Okay, but I know like you give practical things. It's your uh, lab, right? So here we go. We'll start with get up. Come get up. Take communion if you wish. It's available for everybody. It's an enough here. But we have to put the gloves on and a mask on so we're properly COVIDed. We're, and we'll take communion. I'd like you to grab it if you'd be willing to come and grab it and then come have a seat. Don't take it yet. Uh, and we're going to do that. We'll have uh, this opportunity. I say a prayer. We'll come grab communion. And then I want you to, to come back to your seat if you'd be willing to do that. And then we're going we're gonna to take it together. But it comes with this idea that we're going to understand our new reality and we're going to start living into it. We're going to leave no provision for sin. But we're going to hear the message of God. He says, get up. And understand that it's all nailed to the cross. Come remember that with us in communion. Let me say a prayer. Dear Father, we praise you, we praise you, we praise you. Lord, I know, and if anything, even just me, there are some here who've got some mats in their life they just need to pick up. Lord, I know that there are some here who maybe have been a little too comfortable with uncomfortable. I need to get up and make a choice. But Lord, in this moment, I pray you speak to our heart. We're going to spend this time in remembrance of the fact that the old man is nailed to the cross. That you've redeemed the world. Scripture says that you've overcome sin. But it has no more power over us. And even for the ones that have never walked away, Lord, you've given us a, a regenerated life, not filled with atrophy. So thank you, Lord, for calling us and for finding us and for guiding us. Lord, bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
while you're holding the bread and the cup in your hands. The bread represents the new body. That old self is done away with. We see that in Jesus. He gave the new body to the man and he says, get up. And the blood represents the sin being washed away. Listen to this at verse 12 of chapter 5. He, Jesus found him, which is awesome. We're going to talk about that later at some point when we get there. We're going to talk about Jesus finds you. And he goes and finds the man. Verse 14, actually. It says, Later Jesus found him in the temple, and he said to them, See, you are well again. You have the body. Stop sinning, or something else worse might happen. He says, Now live the new life. You're covered in his blood. So I want you to do is I want you to take the body and I want you to eat it. That's your new body. It's a symbol. But it's yours. The new self is here. And you can walk. You can run. You are free from the lies of the world today. Now the sweetness of the juice, the washing clean, it's you. Take that. That's the symbol. Get up. Take up your mat. And let's walk together. We might be a small little church in Solomon, Kansas. But man, what God can do with a little story of some healing. Amen. You're healed. You've got the knowledge. It's yours. Now the choice is is yours. Are you willing to get up? We're going to be here today, and if anyone needs to study more, talk more, pray, if there's things you need to let go and realize, man, I've got some mats in my life, and I even need help, right? Sometimes some mats are so big, you need help. We're here. We're here as a family. We're here to, to pray with you. Walk alongside. And, and let me tell you, church, that's a big thing. We have to come alongside each other. We've got to do this together. And the, and the beauty of, of what's said here is, is there's this action to belief, right? We've given you the knowledge. Now that you take the knowledge and you start putting feet to the knowledge. And faith starts growing. And there's, there's more we get to do. We start unra unraveling what this belief manifested in our life looks like. And yes, that might mean saying, go do some work. Not a get to, but a got to. Just like I do when I speak to the men or where I work is, is no longer is it just asking for something free because it's already given. Now go and do we want to partner with you in that. We want to work with you in that. Come alongside with you. Co-labor with you in that. So please, don't let this moment go away. We've got a song here that, that Luke has picked, which I'm so excited, but we're called, called to come alongside and, and let God heal us and called to, to, to be in Him, with Him. And I want you to, to stand in a moment. I want you to worship with us. But if there's anyone or anything you need, you can come talk with us. You can come during the song. You can come after the song. You can call Brett at 3 o'clock in the morning, me after 12. Yeah, I mean, just him. But know anything you need. Not because we're God. Well, we're his hands and feet. 
and we're called to work. My wife, we were studying this morning. She was studying and reading this morning. And she's like, you know, she, it hit me. She was reading. She's like looking into what God said. And he did a lot more touching than talking. If you really understand it, go read scripture. He does a lot more touching than talking because the word became flesh. The law clarified through the purity of Christ is beautiful. So the words are there. Jesus came so that we might have a pattern to follow and have life. And, I'll keep reading, life and more abundantly. Amen? So everyone stand up with me. Lou, come on up. We're going to worship. I'm going to say one more prayer, and then it's going to be you. I've tried to set your stuff up there all smart and fancy. There you go. So we're going to sing. We're going to worship. If there's anything you need, you can come talk with Brad or to me. or a, a lady. If there's a lady that likes to talk, we, you know, boundaries are good. And I, let's be honest, we talk about dude stuff. Okay, he talks way more about dude stuff than I do. I'm California. I got my flip-flops and uh, lattes. But, you know, we've got ladies here that if you want to talk with a lady, you can come and talk with them. This is important. And so it's real. But no matter what, come to worship God. Amen? Let's pray one more time. Lord, we praise you now. Lord, we're going to finish this moment, not finish the walk. We're going to keep walking. We're going to open this time in worship. Lord, speak to our heart. Guide us in this worship, Lord. Lord, whether it be out of key has no value because you hear the heart. Let us make a joyful noise together as we praise you. In Jesus' name. All right. Am I on? Can you guys hear me? There we go. Now I'm on. Okay. Um, let's sing this last one together. Death was arrested. Without all things to be, your love made ways and then mercy come in. When death was arrested, my life grew. Now ash was redeemed, only beauty remains. My orphan heart.
darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with all freedom in vain. That's when death was resting, my life began. Oh, your grace so free washed his you, God, so much for your endless love, Lord, that pours down on us, God, and your grace to forgive us every time that we go back to that mat, Lord, but I pray that you just give us the strength, Lord, to pick up our mats and to walk, to be a new creation in you. In Jesus' name, amen.